that in their um, individual inputs. I'm not gonna introduce you all in depth because it's gonna take long and people want to hear you and not me. Um, but we have Servi Keza here, um, who is not gonna stay for the whole meeting, I think, because she's in India and it's very late. Um, thank you for joining anyway. Um, she is at the Asim Premji University, which I probably mispronounced. Please correct me. Um, and I think you are going to help us bridge um, the theoretical understanding of decolonizing economics and the practical aspects of it. And then we have Danielle Gitzo, um, who is at the University of uh, Bristol, but now in the United States, um, who is going to talk about history uh, of economics. I hope you're in the US. You shook your head. Um, please all correct me if I uh, say wrong things. Um, uh, Amir Libdieu is at the LSE. Um, he's going to talk about trade in his input. And uh, Devi Kadat is associated with different university in the US, uh, for example, the University of Southern California, and um, is talking about macroeconomics and uh, context dependency. That is um, all I'm going to, say, going to say about you, but I have a few remarks, um, a few housekeeping remarks uh, for our participants. There are two chat functions. One is the chat that is already being used, um, I, I see. Um, this is for general remarks and technical questions. And then we have the F and A, the other chat. This is for um, everyone to post questions that we are going to use for the Q&A session um, in the end uh, of this panel. Uh, you can all post your questions and also you can upvote questions. If you think we definitely should ask a question, you can like it and uh, it will go up in the ranking. Um, and also if you want to ask a question in person, um, that will be possible. Without further ado, I have been speaking for long enough. I'm going to hand over to Serbi. Um, thanks a lot, Tabia. First of all, uh, I would like to apologize for coming in late and for requesting your leave early. Uh, but I am in a time zone very different from uh, where probably many of the people who are attending right now are based. Uh, and the, the, the reason I really wanted to come is because it's the second time we've been a part of exploring economics and uh, they're doing such exciting work and we at Econ are excited to be collaborating with them on the panel. I feel uh, genuinely very bad that I can't stay on for my colleagues uh, presentation who's, uh, whose work I really uh, admire. But thanks for recording the session because I would love to go back and uh, listen to the presentations. So what I'm going to do, as uh, Tabia already mentioned, is to just kind of give a very brief introduction to what we'll be talking about today. Uh, by way of introduction, as uh, you know, you would know, uh, we are part of uh, Diversifying and Decolonizing Economics Initiative, which uh, deals with or rather engages with issues both related to diversity, but diversity more broad broadly defined uh, apart from identity-based diversity into also diversity in terms of theoretical strands which go, uh, which closely align with the pluralist, uh, you know, kind of uh, agenda that exploring economics is talking about. Uh, and also the issue of decolonizing. And decolonizing particularly has become sort of a buzzword in the last uh, year or two. And therefore, it's, it's, it's taken various forms. It's taken forms of where it's almost aligned always as diversification. But it's also taken other interesting forms because it's opened up various debates and engagements as well. What we're going to do is to kind of present an idea that has kind of developed through, uh, uh, you know, engagements with my colleagues at the Econ about how to think about this idea of decolonizing and how and where does it overlap and depart from the issue of diversity and then, uh, uh, you know, open uh, kind of the stage for my colleagues to come in and talk about something uh, more concrete than what I'll be presenting today. So, um, what does a decolonized version of economics look like? Does this imply that we have more voices from the post-colonial economies? Yes. But does it only imply that we have more voices from the post-colonial economies? No. So that's where we want to make the distinction clear. Because what 
we are kind of trying to uh, do here is also to analyze the radical roots of this project. And by radical roots of the project, we mean that we are very much aligned to understanding the issues of diversity and geographic, geographical positionalities, but also to go beyond it while identifying that they are representations or manifestations of various kinds of processes of colonization that have come into being, but also to recognize that what are the structures through which this colonization or through, these, through, through which these manifestations and representations are reflected in the current scenario. So the, the point here by saying that we are moving beyond, we are assessing the radical roots of the project is to move beyond taking a global North centric understanding as a starting point. And what is it that I mean by global North centric understanding? I'll just speak about in a little while, but, but to think about it very broadly is to move beyond such that post-colonial economies are only analyzed from the lens of a Western thought. Once that happens, then of course it snowballs into Western scholars being overrepresented, and particularly Western white male, uh, you know, uh, cis scholars being overly represented. But the point here is that we need to move beyond where everything else, apart from that locus, which becomes the locus of the global north, becomes just a divine or an aberration, such that it is something that has to be corrected or will only be analyzed as a lack vis-a-vis -vis the global north. Now then comes the question of what is it that I mean by global north centric or global north that I've been talking about? Is it merely a geographical location? Uh, it does have overlaps of geography, but it's also something more than that. What Global Not does is it represents the essence of capitalism and the kind of essence that's posed as the imagination for much of the world to realize, which is, uh, which is why also the non-mainstream strands that critique capitalism are also actively and structurally excluded even within the Global North. We've seen this in terms of, uh, you know, uh, heterodox department being uh, uh, robbed of all funding, heterodox departments practically shutting down because they are critiquing that idea of global north, which is the essence of capitalism. So we're moving away from that sort of a just a west or a north or a south and uh, east, but we're talking about truly a global north because, and that becomes important because then, uh, you know, what we're talking about is that even within the non-mainstream, the critique now. So, so uh, let me let me actually talk about two things here. One is, of course, that even within the global south, there will be certain other forms of colonization and colonization of knowledge that would go on. It is not to say that everybody who's based in the global south will be working on heterodox approaches, which is not the case. Which talks about the scale of colonization, which is not just spatial but also extends beyond that. The other point that I wanted to make is uh, the, the, the thing gets even, the issue gets even more problematic because even within the main non-mainstream, the critiques that emanate from the global south are not that prevalent, which adds another layer of issue that we are trying to bring to fore. One is between this idea of what global north represents vis are we others, the heterodox and the mainstream, uh, the way it gets represented in uh, disciplines of, such as economics, but then even within the non-mainstream, the critiques that would emanate from Global South or those that take Global South as the center are not that prevalent. So then are we talking about shifting of a focus towards Global South such that that becomes the locus of our understanding? No, because then that creates an alternate power hierarchy and that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is dislocating that locus where everything is seen just as an aberration from that one to the other, which Spivak, you know, uh, calls in her work about the process of otherization is something that we are uh, meaning to uh, go beyond. And it's important to know that it is not something that would just happen in terms of, uh, or rather to make my point a little more clear, probably it'll be useful to invoke that it's not something that just happens in terms of colon former colonizers and uh, former colonies, but also in terms of, let's say, identity-based differentiation or any other forms of binaries that continue to be created. There are internal colonizations that happen both within Global North and Global South. There are colonizations in terms of identities that happen in Global North as well as in Global South, caste-based within 
uh, India and South Asia and similarly race based in various other parts of the world, where, for example, gender offers an uh, interesting example here because the masculinity, which is often celebrated in the economic models also goes to basically being a capitalist rationality, a capitalist modernity. So those hierarchies that we're talking about with a capitalism, in fact, get recreated in these various spheres. So what we're talking about is questioning that representation of that one singular truth as the universal truth, where the truth is derived from one understanding of what capitalism is and what development and what uh, you know, the unilinear trajectory of progress is, which is informed, of course, by a very uh, not centric thought. Uh, so what I'm going to do is basically on that note, kind of just try to uh, lay the, uh, you know, uh, without taking much time, just kind of trying to open it up to invite my colleagues to make their points where they will particularly be, as Tabi already pointed out, will be talking broadly about the issues, uh, you know, uh, about the, uh, uh, focal areas of history of economic thought, trade, and macroeconomics, but while using those as the broad focal areas, also be engaging with this issue of decolonizing in praxis while dealing with questions of economics teaching and pedagogy, while talking about interdisciplinarity and context dependency and how our research needs to be informed by it, and talking about activism, journal publication, and various other things, such that this entire frame is then bridging the gap from uh, theory to praxis. And to just kind of end uh, it here is uh, what I would like to say is that I try to lay out a theoretical, uh, uh, you know, sort of a setup, one possible theoretical setup to think about uh, decolonizing. But then uh, it's interesting to again see that when often when we talk about diverse uh, decolonizing, we are we're dealing with the specific manifestations of it. This is not to argue that we do not deal with the manifestations because they are the form of water battleground, but also the point is to recognize what are the structural aspects of it such that it can be critiqued in its entirety. So thank you very much. Uh, I will give, my, give the floor to my colleague. Um, thank you. Thanks, Serbi. Um, okay, I guess we can do it in an informal way and we can um, share ourselves. So I guess I'm, I'm next. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, okay. So again, uh, just to, to echo some of the words that Sibi said, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here in this evening for me. So I'm, I'm in the UK at the moment, so it's early evening. Um, again, a pleasure to, to be collaborating again with the Exploring Economics team. Um, you are doing such an important work for, for pluralism and for engaging in these debates on decolonization and bringing the awareness and how this is important for us to rethink the economics curriculum. So yeah, a pleasure to, to be here and and share the, the table with, with my colleagues. So I'm gonna bring the example of history of economic thought, which is my, my field of expertise. Um, and I, I decided to structure my, my talk, um, which I'll try to keep uh, on, the, on the 15 minutes as, as I agreed. Um, but I'll try to structure my talk with um, three main areas, which is the teaching, research and activism and how I see um, decolonization in practice in, in my case. And also I added this initial point here about the awakening moment for, for decolonizing or how I actually started on this journey and, and my personal experience when I actually I realized how the, the layers of power and how this idea of knowledge dependency and what is considered to be good examples or bad examples, how this still very much dominates um, in the case of economics, but more broadly in the case of um, knowledge production and dissemination. So, in my case, so I'm, I'm Brazilian. I took my, my degrees in Brazil, my economics degrees in Brazil before I, I came to the UK. And I think my awakening moment, I mean, I was always very interested in history of economic thought and in history more generally, this is my, my area of expertise. But I come from a context where the economics degree is much more plural, right? So you, you are um, trained in the usual ne mainstream neoclassical, um, framework, but you also have other approaches very much 
um, guided towards the, the Brazilian context. So you study Brazilian economic history, you study um, Brazilian economics, um, regional economics. Um, and that for me played an important role, not to mention, of course, the heterodox training, which is, which is very um, widely disseminated in, in that context. But I think my awakening moment, or I always knew that there was this division of knowledge and how problematic it was. But when actually I came to the UK, I realized how, how shocking it was to see, well, for instance, history of economic thought is essentially dead in the UK. There is very few people that work on the field and still the very few courses that still exist in history of economic thought in British um, universities, they tend to have this approach of a very linear, uh, what we call Whiggish history, which is very much centered on white men individuals and this idea that um, the evolution of ideas is very, um, it evolves very naturally and you essentially hide all debates or everything that is non-linear. So this, I think, was my awakening moment. And then I realized that something was happening that was much more serious. And the fact that, that this model is usually taken as a good example, is, is taken as an approach to other contexts, to especially to curriculums and to universities in the global south. But I'll talk about this um, a little bit more later on. So um, then I'll, I'll focus on the, the teaching, research, and activism focusing on this example of um, the case of history of economic thought. So when I think about teaching, um, as I said, so in my context where I am, history of economic thought is a, is a misrepresented field. Misrepresented field for two things. Well, I, I tend to, to approach the history of economic thought as very much this plural field. Uh, it's not necessarily mainstream, it's not necessarily heterodox because it is in a different level of realisticness because this is where all ideas and approaches in economics, they come together, uh, where, uh, whether they are um, heterodox or not. Uh, however, um, the history of economic thought is, in my view, very useful because it is here where you can actually see the dirty laundry of economics. So it is, it is not linear. It, it's not about something that evolves very naturally and these ideas come together in a beautiful way. They bloom and then everybody accepts them. There is a consensus and then we move on. No, it's much more uh, complex than that. So we have the accidents, we have the debates, we have the repressing um, of the voices that are repressed. We have dominant approaches and theories. So we cannot think about the evolution of ideas without taking the issue of power and how ideas um, are disseminated in certain ways. So history of economic thought, we have this intellectual um, approach, so how ideas evolve. But in my case, I'm more interested in the sociological part or what makes these ideas be accepted or not. Um, in the case of history of economic thought today, so most of the surviving courses in my context in the UK, they still uh, largely approach the, the evolution of ideas as something that it's very uncontested, is a linear truth, and is usually made by white European males. And I'll show you an example of how this is done in a second. Um, there's a few reasons for that. One uh, is because some scholars say, well, mainstream economists or neoclassical economists are not that interested in the history of the discipline or it's only interested in the history of the discipline, which tends to reinforce their truth. So there are two, two approaches to, to this. But then I, I pose the question, is, this a, is there a standard um, correct approach to the history of economic thought? And should we actually take this as an example when doing economics outside the English speaking world? So the Anglo US system. Why am I emphasizing this? Because um, some of the, the work that I've, I've done over the past few years really and, and um, tried to explore why we take the economics curriculum that is done in the UK, US and Australia as a good economics curriculum. And this idea of the example to follow really um, shows that it is followed in the sense of the knowledge that you're going to disseminate students in the sort of 
um, not emphasizing the original realities, you kind of hide other elements. And I think, in my view, this is what makes the difference when we try to decolonize um, economics. So this is the thing that we're actually trying to bring again, these things that are usually hidden. So a standard um, history of economic thought curriculum looks, looks like this. So, I mean, <laughs> I could spend hours just um, yeah, discussing this slide, but it's essentially a group of white European males, right? And again, we take this as something that evolves very naturally, like we have Aristotle, we have Plato, and this evolves in a beautiful way until we get to, let's say, modern economics, which is um, Keynes, Friedman, and the sort of post-war economic thought. But is this really the case? So is this something that we're actually after? So I usually tell, tell my students, this is normally um, the standard approach to history of economic thought. I would like to see something that looks more like this, right? So we have other approaches, we have other um, concepts, other scholars coming from different parts of the world, from different times, from different places. And I could bet that 99% of economists are not aware of these names, especially those located in the global north. So echoing what Serbi was saying, it's not about shifting the, the power and say, well, now it is about the global ideas from the global south dominating. No, but actually what, what we want to bring it is to bring those voices that were hidden, forgotten, and basically erased from history. And they are very important. Why? Because they help us to understand regional realities, different economic contexts, and it makes us actually do better and more realistic economics. So the example that I take in my teaching when I think about decolonizing economics uh, is to think about the history of economic growth and economic development. So in my view, when we talk about decolonization in teaching, one of the things that we have to emphasize is this exercise of deconstructing and challenging power. So it's not about the evolution of ideas as um, economist one says this, economist two says this, they complement each other, they agree, and they move happily ever after. No, it's really about challenging the ideas and why these ideas become um, standard and they become dominated. So in this example that I bring in, in class, it's really to reposition the dominance of a key um, concept or a key idea. So for instance, if we think about how this um, emphasis or this uh, drive for economic growth came together. Well, it wasn't always like this. If history can really teach us something is that it wasn't always like this. So why has economic growth became so important? So usually I take um, to my students some papers and policy discussions about the ideas of growth and development. So usually these are historical products of a specific time and place. So this came together in post-war economics, so after the Second World War, there was this consensus from the winning nations to create some sort of methodologies and measurements that was easily comparable across nations. So you could measure um, economic growth, you could measure, for instance, GDP. So this is how it became so, so important. And then I bring a contested, uh, or let's say, thinking about the alternative decolonial approach, I bring dependency theory. So how would this idea of economic growth fit in there? When we take dependency theory, so reading the works of the, the classics from dependency theory, so Rupert Prebrich, Maria Conceição Tavares, Celso Furtado, we can see that actually growth and development are so much more complex than that. It's not about thinking about the solo growth model where you increase your um, stock of savings per capita and there you go, there's your recipe. No, it's much more complex than that. So let's look into that. Then I see a few problems here. The first one is that these voices were ignored, right? They were shut down because they don't conform. The second point is that the um, dominance of knowledge is much more complex. Why? Because most of these works are not written in English. So um, you have to really to depend into translations. And this is something that I'm gonna talk about later on, which still persists today. So it is very hard for these voices to be heard. So I think one of the points that when we think about decolonizing is to bring those, those voices in, into classroom and also into research. So 
what I do in the case of my research, where I try to implement this, is to actually look into the history of these communities. So um, how these communities, they come together when we think about outside UK and US heterodox communities. This is the work that I've, I've been doing at the moment. Ideas are important, yes, but my view is that we need to look into the sociology. So how these ideas are accepted or not, what makes them acceptable or not, do they have to conform to certain things or not? The case that I'm exploring at the moment that I'm very interested in, I'm developing this with other colleagues is the case of Brazil. The case of Brazil, in the case of the heterodox community there, for me, it's, it's quite, I wouldn't say puzzling, but it's, it, it brings me this curiosity because it's a very large heterodox community. But to actually understand how this community works, it is still underexplored and unknown. So there is an important work to be done there by historians of economic thought, especially recent historians of economic thought from, let's say, the 1950s, 1960s after. And to think about how these barriers exist. Why? Because when we started looking into the case of intellectual communities in Brazil for heterodoxy, we see that most scholars, they had to be trained abroad. So they were largely trained in the US and in the UK. So these ideas, they traveled, and then you start to develop their own versions, but usually you still have this dominance of ideas. And you have the other invisible barriers, which are still very much dominant. So it is about what I call the colonized um, knowledge and language. So you have to conform to certain norms. So if we take the, the idea of dependency theory, dependency theory also can be applied to this idea of knowledge. So the core or the global north dictates the rules and the periphery has to follow. So you, you have to follow the ideas or you have to publish on the journals that the, the core is doing. You have to follow their rules. You have to um, really much um, take what, what they do as the truth. And then if you don't do that, you are penalized. So your work is considered to be poor quality or you're not, you don't have the same conditions to disseminate your work and you're going to be inevitably marginalized and this becomes a self-reinforcing system. So decolonizing for me, it is about bringing the knowledge, bringing the ideas, challenging this power, uncovering, and also showing that it is not just about the ideas, but there's this whole um field of power behind it so just to finish my my presentation because i know i'm running out of time so how am i trying to do this in terms of activism which i think is also very something very important is to think about how we could challenge this okay through teaching through research i think this is very important for us as academics to bring those voices heard in the case of my work um I think it's also very important for us to question the curriculum. And this is what I've been trying to do in terms of economics education, to really think about how we um, design the economics curriculum. Is it about ticking the boxes? So, okay, you have to deliver that neoclassical mainstream knowledge. Is it really? Are we actually training better economists if we do this? Or is it better to actually train economists who understand the realities that they have to explore? So this is what I refer to the benchmark statement. So in the case of the UK, we have a suggested framework of a curriculum of how an economics curriculum should look like. Universities are, are suggested to, to follow this. And I think that changing that benchmark is an important step. So to bringing those voices is not just about adding a few names or bringing more examples from the global south. No, it's actually cha challenging the narrative. And I do not see how we could do this without challenging also the standard approach to so the mainstream economics. So I think it is a package that comes together. Um, also, of course, we want to draw from examples from the global south and uh, question the colonial dominance of Anglo-based education as being successful. So why do we still expect um, universities in the global south to follow this curriculum and why is this considered to be successful i think this is something that we really need to challenge um, i'm still thinking about how we could actually do this if anybody raising questions or comments in the discussion i would be happy to hear your thoughts and something that i've been working on at the moment with my other colleagues here at decon is to think about 
going beyond the English language. So how language matters in academia and especially in economics. So how can we challenge journal publications in English, how we could actually try to disseminate this knowledge beyond English and to actually make the journals and other voices that are not in English to be heard and to be considered of good quality as well. So that's all that I had to say. Um, if you're interested in, an, um, in our network in DECON, here I add the links for you to take a look at our work. So now I'm going to pass to my other colleagues for them to, to continue the, the presentation. So thanks very much. So now I think we have Amir, if I'm wrong, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for the presentation. It will be very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to be uh, next after you, given the amount of insights you've presented. But um, I will try to provide um, a relatively kind of brief perspective on decolonizing economics, mostly uh, from uh, in terms of you know trade, uh, and mostly drawing on the uh, the African uh, continent. So yeah, one, one my second. name is Amir Lebdui, and I'm also uh, glad to be part of of DCON, uh, which is a very very interesting initiative. Amir, can you hear me? Well, I can hear you. Uh, you maybe ask you me can to turn... wait one second? Yes, maybe you can try turning your video off because the connection is very bad. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's better now. Amir, we can hear you, but you're going in and out. So maybe you should turn your camera off. Sure. Thanks, Devika. <laughs> cool. Can you... Okay. I think it's better cool. now. Um, yeah, I think it's better. All right. Can you hear me fine now? Cool. Yes. All right. So I'll keep. Uh, I'll keep. Going. Lovely. So. Um, wait a second. All right. So my presentation will be uh, divided in uh, kind of three main sections. Uh, I'll first talk about uh, research, then I'll talk about the, uh, and how to decolonize kind of, you know, economics through one's research, then I'll address the issue of teaching, like what does a decolonized teaching philosophy look like, and then I'll talk about uh, you know, academic behavior and activism to promote uh, the decolonization of economics. Just to check in with you that you're still hearing me correctly. Yes, it works fine. Yes. Lovely. I think there is a little bit of that, but as long as you can hear me, that's fine. So, um, first talking about research, and I very much uh, agree with the points made. Uh, previously about kind of having to go beyond framework and theory that were developed in the context and work in the context of the global north uh, in order to explain southern experiences. Uh, and in a way, it, it relates to broader uh, approach to research. Broadly speaking, we can differentiate uh, inductive from deductive uh, approaches. Uh, deductive approaches are aimed at testing theory and hypothesis regarding particular subject of study uh, by collecting and analyzing empirical data. And that helps, that enables one to confirm or refute original theories. Inductive approaches in contract, they, they work in reverse and they move uh, from specific observation to broader generalization and theory in order to generate new theory emerging from the data. And in practice, the border between the two quite 
first, right? Uh, most research can be a mix of both. Both are actually fine. The problem is when uh, the, the fact that most of this research done in the northern context tends to be inductive by right? trying to generate new theory based on you know experiences in the USA, the EU, and so on. While very often economists tend to look at the, uh, the developing, developing countries in a conductive fashion, right? trying to test uh, preconceived theories and notions without necessarily going to trouble in terms of thinking how can new theory, how can new knowledge be created by this as opposed to kind of forcing a framework or a uh, model. And in practice, what does it look like? I wanted to talk about some of my research uh, on, the, on, on the issue. And the first one is a well-known uh, concept of compared language, right? Uh, this is a uh, notion developed by the economist Ricardo a few centuries ago, kind of based on the idea that you should focus on uh, exporting and producing what you do best. And this is typically a concept that works in the context of developing developed economies, but not necessarily in the context of developing one, right? Where it's not really about just maximizing or you can do best with creating new comparative advantage. And this is why when looking at this aspect, most uh, economists based in the global north, uh, studying global south countries tend to focus on static views of comparative advantage, uh, whereas it's more helpful to think of it in dynamic terms. Um, uh, even looking at things like the resource curse and, 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 and resource revenue management, which is a topic I work on, there's been the question that one should raise is, what is the objective of the research, right? What is the objective of um, developing economics? And very often the research on that aspect has focused on, you know, the neoclassical emphasis on uh, uh, equilibria and macroeconomic stability, and very often at the expense of development and structural transformation. Um, the other point that I wanted to make in the context of research is about giving credit where credit is due. Something that we collectively need to go beyond is this, and I really like Daniel's uh, 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 slide showing kind of, you know, the, the alternative economic thinkers that we, that we should be studying. But basically it's a session with uh, with um, giving credit of uh, economic concepts to uh, basically white European male males, even when it's not uh, the case. So there is a variety of thinking in the issue. And if you do work on economic history, actually any topic you could work on, we really should make an effort to try to include those voices because it matters even the perception of where theory generated from. And one author I wanted to highlight in particular to, uh, to, uh, to back my, my argument is Ibn Khaldun, which was one of the, one of the authors uh, in, in Daniel's slide. And the reason I want to mention him is because his work really debunks this idea that people like Adam Smith, uh, Marx, and others later pioneered uh, concepts like, uh, uh, first of all, the, 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 the law of supply and demand, right? Uh, his work, which was already in the 14th century, there's already the idea of the law of supply and demand in determining, determining, determining prices. Um, in terms of uh, labor theory of value, right? So Marx is very often recognized as the first uh, person to have theorized uh, a labor theory of value, right? That value is derived from labor. And if you read that Ibn Khaldun's work, this notion is already present very strongly, right? And, 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 and explained in, in very complex terms. Um, and same, and uh, when the, the, the so-called Laffer curve, right? The idea that um, kind of the more the tax rate is increased, the less you know, income, tax incomes is generated. This is an idea that we have So as part of, you know, kind of this thinking, these are the things that we should do, collecting the, you know, the Khaldun curve or Khaldun Laffer curve. These are the small things that we can do that actually have a big impact in terms of the perception of where theory comes from. 
Um, the second aspect I was going to mention relates to teaching, right? Uh, what does a decolonial teaching philosophy look like? Uh, what can we do better? And actually, this is not very conventional. I wanted to read a short uh, poem uh, written by the Persian author and uh, poet um, Rumi, uh, which really puts a finger on why uh, pluralism matters uh, economics. Well, actually, it seems to have gone in this refreshing fast enough. So not, okay, there he is. The poem is called Tent in the Dark. Um, so uh, I, I encourage you to, to go check it out later on. But actually, instead of reading it, uh, I'll just explain it and, and read the last point, and you can check out the poem years later. So the idea is there is an elephant in the dark, right? And that people uh, are uh, different, like a cloud, which can kind of touch the object and they don't know what it is. Amir, sorry, everyone. Still... Yeah. Okay, sorry, everyone, about the technical difficulties. I think um, it would be good for Amir to maybe see if he can get a better connection. And maybe in the meantime, Divika, you can um, just continue. Sorry, everyone. Sounds good. Um, I think I'm back. Can you see me? Yes. Yes, you're back. Oh, Try talking. Sh shift yeah. it to my 3G in case it works better. Mm. And maybe... Uh, I'm talking I mean, do you now. Think... Can you hear me well? Yeah, now it is working. We can hear you. Sometimes you slow down and sometimes you speed up. So that's the issue. It's like, you're like, you know, you're talking and then you slow down. Then it's like, no, 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 no. So that's why it's sometimes unclear. Um, Amir? Maybe, yeah. Amir, maybe you can uh, continue for half a minute. And if it doesn't work, I would suggest uh, that we hear Divika first. If that Amir, is okay with there? everyone. Amir. Okay. Oh, okay. Maybe that. Divika, you just uh, continue. Okay. I'm going to talk to Amir. Uh, I can't share my screen since he's still sharing my screen. Okay, I'll just start uh, until we figure out how I can share my screen. Yeah, oh, we're going to okay, take can... care of the screen sharing situation. Um, I think I can share my screen now. Okay. Um, so I think my my colleagues did a really great job so far, even though Amir had um, uh, technical difficulties. But anyway, so um, I again, I uh, my name is Devika. I just finished my PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and um, yeah, various affiliations, but uh, all in the work. So right now, take take me as a doctor from uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And as as uh, Danielle talked about history of economic thought, and Amir talked about trade and economic history, my sort of area of specialism is macro, monetary economics, and international finance. So I'm just going to sort of like limit my comments to macro. And I guess like. Um, um, so I, I want to sort of circle back to what we mean by decolonizing. I think my colleagues have done a really great job in sort of like emphasizing more than more, several times that like when we're talking about decolonizing, which has become a buzzword in like in academic circles, it's still sort of nascent in economics because for a variety of reasons that we can get into them if you want to, that it's not only a question of diversity, which is a worthy goal in itself. So like the idea of decolonizing economics is not just adding like in a global sense, of course, like various in various uh, parts of the world, it'll look different, but it's not only about sort of like adding people from the global South or adding people who look like me, who look slightly different, as a, who are not like white European men. I feel like that's that's a worthy goal in itself, but that's not what decolonizing economics is about. Decolonizing economics is a much larger question of challenging the way in which knowledge is produced in economics. And, and what are the structures that sort of like 
uh, fundamentally exclude certain people, certain ways of thinking, certain theories, and certain geographies. So that's kind of what we're talking about. Basically, what counts as economics? Like, what are the boundaries of the discipline? Um, that's that's sort of uh, part of the point of like what is economics and where do we where do we draw the line? Um, who counts as an economist? And here we can talk about it's a question of diversity, but not not only a question of diversity. It's a question of like, oh, is it that people who have PhDs are they economists, or people who practice like in economic policy are they economists? Are people who uh, advocate for economic rights on behalf of the communities can we count them as producers of economic knowledge? And 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 from a decolonized perspective, I would say yes, that we should count them as producers of economic knowledge. But it's something that we don't really consider very much. Um, furthermore, it's like so yeah, so that kind of knowledge, like does that count as economics? So that's a question of what counts as economics and where economics is knowledge, where economics knowledge is housed or created in the sense, like, is it in, is it, is it the preserve of uh, economic journals, which are predominantly based in the global North, uh, at least the ones that are globally read um, are predominantly based in the global North and the university that are considered like top creators of economic knowledge within the mainstream and within the heterodoxy are unfortunately all at least most of them are, are in the global north and so is it that that's that's where economics knowledge is created or is it something far more diverse is it in different geographies and stuff like that these are the questions that really matter when we're when we're talking about decolonizing economics and ultimately as danielle and serbi and amir pointed out is it's ultimately a question of recognizing the venues of power within economics and working to dismantle them in that uh, who is excluded? How is how are they excluded? What kind of knowledge is excluded? And why is it the case? Like it is fundamentally a question of power. It's not, as Danielle pointed out, a free exchange of ideas. It's not some kind of like free marketplace of ideas. And in fact, if it were a free marketplace of ideas, our discipline would look fundamentally radically different, like unrecognizable uh, than it than it does today. Okay. And so it's a question of working to dismantling those questions of those. It's not about getting more uh, women or more uh, people of color or black people or people from like non upper caste in the Indian context to the table. It's about like smashing the table so that it's a far more equitable um, field um, in which it's not hindered by several aspects of power. So that's the idea of decolonizing. So I thought it was worth circling back to that. When it comes to macro, which is again, like sort of my, um, my reason for being in my pet peeve. Uh, and so part of like what I can think about the trouble with macroeconomics is that the starting point of macro is shockingly uniform. So as Danielle pointed out, like she was talking about her, her sort of journey in decolonizing economics. I did most of my, uh, I did two of my three degrees in economics in India. And so I have learned, like, I, I've taken several macroeconomics courses. I feel like I was counting and I got up to 10. Um, some of them in India and some of them in the United States. And so uh, what was shockingly common is the, is the base knowledge that was, you know, like the, as Danielle said, the benchmark that was taken as given that all of us have to know. So like Danielle, when I was still in India, I had to learn a lot about Indian economic history, Indian economic problems. But at the same time, when it comes to economic theory, it was still the same micro, macro, econometrics, et cetera. It was still the same kind of knowledge. Even when thinking of development, it was what I learned there was was not very different from what I was learning in the United States, which was really shocking to me. Um, I taught, I have taught macroeconomics in uh, the US and I've learned macroeconomics in India and we still use the same textbook. And I was like, this makes no sense to me. How is it that the universal theory that we're learning, no matter if it's in India or, and again, like I have had mainstream education and like heterodox education in both places, okay? In both places, like these two books are the most widely used books. And if you, if you haven't been taught by these books, I think it's a great thing. Like, I don't think it's a bad thing, but odds are that you're very familiar with uh, David Romer's Advanced Macroeconomics and Olivier Blanchard's Macroeconomics, okay? Uh, like this for the undergraduate level and this for the graduate level over here. And so typically when we're teaching macro or studying macro, the, the assumption, and we, don't, we never make this expl assumption explicit, is that we're studying an advanced industrialized nation. That's sort of the starting point and it's some sort of monolith, okay? And if we consider developing economies, it's sort of considered an afterthought. In fact, we only consider developing economies in the problem of development, at least, you know, 
again, largely, of course, there are exceptions. And we never really think of, or at least when we're teaching, we think of macro and then we think of development separately. We think of long-term development, that's something we teach. And then there's macro as like short-term uh, economic problems or even long-term, but again, from the lens of the, from the, from the advanced, uh, of advanced industrializations. So that is the benchmark. And heterodox economics is better, but not by much, okay. Um, for instance, like, we're talking about like, they're still going to center questions of power, but they're still sort of, as Danielle pointed out, like coming, and Amir pointed out, coming a lot from the global North. We're attributing things to Marx, we're attributing things to, um, or we're looking at like, one of my favorite articles in macroeconomics, like forever is uh, by Mikhail Kolechki called the um, political aspects of full employment, which is like truly like, I'm sure you've read it. And if you haven't, I highly recommend you read it. Change my life, um, which is again, a very important, um, text for students of macroeconomics and it really centers power however like once again once you focus your entire energies of macro on the problems of demand i think we're losing we're, we're missing so many particular particularities um in uh, of other structural features in developing economies that are not considered let's take the example of inflation okay so um so let's think of it this way. Whenever we start thinking of inflation, the first thing that you think but that you're taught in macro is about the Phillips curve. Okay. And so it's a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. And there, so if we if we have like if there's uh if there's if workers have more bargaining power, they'll bargain for higher wages. So if the labor market is tight, they have higher bargaining power and therefore they can they can bargain for higher wages and therefore that's gonna lead to higher inflation. And of course, like expectations play a role, like oil prices play a role, like that's the typical example in Blanchard, which again I've learned and taught for years. Now this is the source of a lot of like economic policy in several countries. For example, inflation targeting is a direct, in my opinion, a result of this. However, it's bizarre to me that like um, that there's so many other factors that that contribute to inflation that are always always relegated to a second order position. And it's not that like that's not important or that we don't consider it because our understanding of inflation has become so Eurocentric that the starting point of inflation is to start from the Phillips curve, no matter where you're looking from it. There are serious problems, not only in like the study of the macroeconomy, but in the practice of like economic policy of macroeconomics. For instance, in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, central banks around the world have been like all guns blazing, uh, using all kinds of monetary policy tools to make sure that they have like um, expanded monetary policy in every sense of the term. However, several developing economies, central banks have had to, could not do that. You know, they couldn't do that to, to, to the same extent. In some cases, they're already starting to pull back on their monetary policy levers. But but isn't there like a massive collapse in demand? And if there is a massive collapse in demand, what justifies this? And what justifies this is that the sources of inflation are different in developing economies or they're not, or to a large extent, they're very different, which you've definitely under theorized. And therefore the practice of it is very different. And therefore like, this is a very important aspect that should depend on the context in which you're studying. And the study of macroeconomics or the teaching of macroeconomics depends on the context in which you're learning and 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 therefore needs to take into account like a non-eurocentric understanding of all these phenomena where, where we can't simply look at it from the same lens and the same categories now you you could argue like and i know this is a very global audience but like um i know like the we're looking at berlin time and so what if what if you're not interested in developing economies you know like that's just not what you study so is decolonizing not relevant for us if it's only about like bringing in the context of developing economies maybe like i'm not interested in developing economies let's say i am but let's say that's what you say so then is the idea of decolonizing economics not important um i would say no because there's so many insights from developing economies that are relevant because there are several aspects of the advanced industrialized nations that are not theorized because they're relegated to a second order position. Um, the current inflation debate is a prime example of how a decolonized understanding of macroeconomics can help us, that structural constraints are important. Now there's a huge debate going about, oh, there's like, inflation is increasing right now and central banks need to like stop or governments need to scale back on fiscal policy. This is the debate that's going around in the, in, you know, the US and Europe and the UK. This is the same debate going around everywhere. But a lot of people are arguing that the, the source of inflation are not demand. It's not that the demand is increasing too, too fast. It's that there's structural barriers, there's supply constraints that are very important here. And once again, like I'm a post-Keynesian macroeconomist. So for me to say that supply constraints are important and like demand is, 
in, in some cases it's more important than demand is like truly like anathema. Uh, I, I'm almost cringing that I'm even saying this, but the point is that structural constraints are important and to learn what is excluded from the, the dominant discord is, is a practice in decolonizing of economics. And therefore there's so much to learn from the context of developing economies, even in advanced industrialized nations. So to move away from a Eurocentric understanding is very important. Again, another important question now is what are the implications of increasing informalization of work on the conduct of monetary of macroeconomic policy in the advanced world like increasingly we have which is again a feature of of developing economies and has been for a really long time and arguably it is also a feature of the advanced nation that just hasn't been theorized as such we often think of developing economies as dual economies with informal economies however um in germany united states and the united kingdom that's also the case and increasingly the case with more platform economies and more informal labor markets so what what implications does it have for the conduct of monetary policy what in implications does it have for conduct of labor policy all of these questions are something that we can gain from if we have a decolonized understanding of economics okay um and like i have several other examples and i'm happy to go on but we're going to run out of time so i'm going to move on um from here but please ask me questions like um i have much more to say about this so at the end of the day where do we go from here right like to say to center power is such an abstract thing to say like what the hell does that mean you know um but i guess what's really important to start questioning uh what what is excluded and why it's excluded and so starting from a pluralist lens of economics is 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 a great starting point and you're you're already at the right place doing that like given that you're in a pluralist summer summer academy think talking about like um talking about different perspectives of economics that's a great starting point but but you need because as danielle said as amir said there's the exclusion is not accidental the exclusion is not as a result of the marketplace of ideas the exclusion is a function of power so to question like what is systematically excluded or rendered less important is worth reflecting on just because another example just came into my mind um uh, again we're talking about the like, inflation and unemployment trade-off um this factoid when i learned last year truly blew, blew my mind it was that in the united states um the um the black population has never experienced full employment and none of the levers of monetary policy or academic or any kind of economic macroeconomic policy even considers that when we talk about full employment in the united states it's usually only about like the average unemployment rate and so it truly blew my mind when somebody said that black people in the united states have never experienced full employment now that's where you ask the question why like we've already theorized the trade-off between unemployment and inflation we've already theorized what is the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment why is it that that non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment doesn't look at the dis disaggregated um uh, unemployment levels across specific like racial or gendered groups this is something that this is a very important question that we need to ask as economists so as i said pluralism and theoretical approach is a crucial starting point introducing diverse perspectives is extremely important but it's not enough i keep saying that it's important to center power and we can discuss on different ways to do so honestly like a lot of this is a work in progress a lot of this we're developing with our colleagues and it's still something that like i don't have all the answers i don't have all the solutions i can identify many problems and so you know it's easy to be a critic everybody's a critic i'm a critic um but at the same time like the point is that we need to create solutions which which also will not look the same for every place because Economics is a global community. When the, the solutions will not look the same in the US, in the UK, or in India, or in Brazil, or in South Africa, from which I know there are several people from those regions. And so it'd be a really great idea to start a conversation of what that looks like uh, in your respective context, because decolonization has to be a global sort of movement. Because if, if it's not, then it's not gonna achieve its goal because we're definitely gonna forget something. Anyway, those are just my comments. So yeah, feel free to ask questions and grill us on this yeah thank you very much devika um it looks like amir is back with another device um hopefully this will allow him to finish uh, his presentation it would be a pity not to hear it hi can you hear me better now sounds Much great yes. ah now you're cutting off again Devika, Danielle, is it better for you than it is for me? No, he froze. 
maybe i don't know would you like to, to go to the discussion and questions and yes then... i think um amir if you can hear me the best thing is to go to the questions um, i think that I mean, yeah. Given the time consideration, is it cutting? Uh, I mean, I is think I understood what you said. I think you suggested oh. to go to the discussion because of the time. I think that's a good idea. Maybe you can take a couple of the questions or add some comments, maybe even in the chat. Um, that would be good. So everyone, please. Uh, Continue asking questions, uh, use the question and answers tool. Um, there are some questions already, and I think we are working on promoting somebody to a participant. Yeah. Wow, great to see you. Um, maybe you want to start by asking your question. Please introduce yourself, Shorty. Hello, everyone. Good evening or good afternoon, depending where you are. Also, good morning, maybe. I'm Jean Pedro. I'm a student um, at the um, Epoch Plus Masters. It's a heterodox masters, which is trying to uh, not only build on pluralism, but also um, try to expand the um, understanding of heterodox economics from different parts of the of the globe. Right now, I'm in Brazil, and I wanted to um, actually question, but also maybe this is a discussion, not necessarily a question, because I don't expect um, the panelists to have an answer to that. But mainly the idea that we know that um, decolonizing and diversifying economics is a necessity. Uh, we know that this has become a buzzword. We necessarily don't know what exactly this would mean. We know that there would be different uh, definitions coming from different perspectives. But what I would like to ask is whether um, it is only an academic procedure in which um, student, in which professors actually will uh, change the curriculum and university will, uh, will adapt their their curriculum and their understanding of economics, or is it also the case that students and student movements can also contribute to this to this movement? And therefore, I would also like to ask whether um, we would can see that the, if the response is country level and country specific, um, how can we understand cooperation from other students? Because I'm pretty sure that cooperating with other students here in this program in the Summer Academy. I will understand that maybe the problem of inflation, inflation being a structural issue, can be not only a problem in Brazil but also maybe in India, and maybe that from that exchange something bigger and greater can actually um, happen. So I would like to ask, what is the role of students, and how can initiatives like this also like um, promote more pluralism and maybe a decolonized economics? Thanks. Uh, Tabea, do you, shall we answer and yeah, or yeah, are you yeah. going I to think, collect a few? No, I think we're going to go do one question at a time okay. um, for now. And you can choose whoever um, wants to respond. And I, to the people asking questions, uh, if you want somebody specific to answer your questions, please um, say so. Davika, do you want to start or shall I go first? You can go first, but like I'll, I'll add something briefly okay. Okay, if it's okay. I mean, we love talking about this. So I'm sure yeah. all of us, including Amir, we're going to answer all questions. Um, yeah, Jean, thanks very much for, for the question. Um, I, 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 sh I really share your, your view about the, the power of student voice. I mean, I think one of the reasons why we're even here now discussing this is what actually happened from 2008 until today. So this idea to push for pluralism, to push for uh, non-global North voices to be heard, to boycott Mankiw on his classroom at some point in 10 years ago, I think. So I, I think there is an incredible value to it. And I, I wish I could come up with better strategies to push for this forward. Um, in, in the case of where I, where I work and with the students that I teach, I really emphasize this to them because we are virtually in a neoliberal higher education system here where students pay a lot of money and they are expected to receive a certain service. So, but you can see that they're very interested in going beyond the mainstream approach. They are very curious. They actually demand this. And so I actually tell them a lot. You need to make this voice heard. So there's so much student feedback and 
what are the expectations that students have. So I think this is the point to, to be made. St if students are aware of this, and this is probably where the bottleneck is, because a lot of people are not aware that these approaches exist. So, but once they are made aware, they want it. They are actually very interested. So I, I'm, I'm, all, I, oh, sorry, I'm all up for going with student voice and student power because I think it makes a huge difference. We could see that some small changes have happened already. My problem is thinking about economics more broadly is let's say the upper echelons of, of the discipline, which I think are much harder to change especially when it comes to research and knowledge production, because I think that that's way more resistance. Um, there's much more resistance there than uh, in the teaching side. Um, yeah, that's, that's my view in a few words. Okay, just to add, um, so I've also been part of the movement for pluralism, I guess, for a while. Um, and, and by the way, we started Decon out of that because we were so annoyed that like pluralism meant like these white dudes from a specific like European or your American perspectives. And that's what it means to be heterodox. And I was like, that seems ridiculous. And I was really annoyed. Like, I feel like we got together because we just somehow coalesced in a way that we were really annoyed by this trend. Um, and it, I mean, in a, on, a, on a personal level, it felt like people like Danielle, me, Amir and Serbi were like, I don't know, it felt like we are not a heterodox economist based on like representation voice and our voices were not, it seemed to be devalued. And so we, it was in, in a sense, it was like rational <laughs> to do so. But apart from that, like how can you do that is, is indeed like in a, in a conversation like this is to like maybe exchange notes about what's different and what people are doing across the world and how they're addressing this problem. Like as Danny, Danielle said that sometimes like you don't know what you don't know. And perhaps by talking to other students, you can figure out what it is that like other people are doing that you don't know, you know, uh, I'm saying no a lot. But the idea is like, you know, talking in collaboration, whatever that looks like, it could be reading groups, it could be like, um, for instance, I'm really interested in macro and I'm, and I'm really trying to figure out a way to read more like, I really want to read Latin American literature because I feel like literally every crisis has happened in Latin America like seven times over. And so, so I need to, I want to figure out like, how can I do that, you know, and learn from others who had more, who had more exposure to those things than I do and sort of like try to make it so that that is important. Like, I, again, like I'm, I don't have all the solutions. We're trying to figure out a lot of this at IndieCon. If you want to be a part of that conversation, you're most welcome to join us. We're always like, we have more ideas than people to implement those ideas. Um, so yeah, but like, I think student development is extremely important because as Danielle said, like the, the older generation is far more resistant to change. Already we've made a lot of enemies amongst even the heterodox community, which is allegedly open-minded. Um, and so many, so many enemies already to what we're talking about decolonizing, you know, and it's something that people take as a threat to themselves. And therefore, the good thing about being a student is that you have a lot of scope for exploration, which is sometimes not always rewarded in terms of like research or grades or whatever. However, you still have more time and more space to do that. So yeah, I actively encourage you to do that, like demand more. Um, if you learn of something, you know, demand it off your professor, demand it off your university, like demand that 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 more um, that more access is provided by your university wherever you are. You know, um, like in the Indian context, that would mean that people need to demand like why is there like less caste representation amongst like why is it only upper caste being represented in the prof professorial body or in like body economic of economists? Like we don't have white people in India. I mean, we do, but like the point is that. It's, it's different, like the hierarchy is different. So like to ask those questions wherever you are, you can do that even, especially if you're a student, you know? Um, so yeah, and it, it is a global movement and what it looks like is different wherever you are, but um, yeah, you can do a lot basically. Thank you. Um, there is another person who wants to ask a question herself. Um, Bina, are you there? Yes. And uh, Danielle and Devika, please try um, to keep your answers short because we still have a couple of questions. Bina. Okay. Um, my question perhaps is not directly related to economics, uh, but about decolonization in, in general. Uh, 
I'm from Indonesia here, so former colonized country. Uh, one of the legacy, quote unquote, after colonization for centuries is um, corruptions and maybe like what uh, Devika said before, like it benefits some social class and how uh, that condition some Indonesian itself want to preserve that status quo. Uh, do you see like how the decolonization of economics see that? Uh, because if these topics are discussed in developed countries, then it doesn't have any benefits for the people from the colonized country. So yeah, that's my curiosity. Perhaps you have some comments on that. Thank you so much. It's 1 a.m. here, <laughs> so good time. Danielle, do you wanna? Do you wanna go first? Okay, uh, very quickly. I guess the, you, you rightly pointed out a lot of it is legacy of colonialism and it's important to recognize that. I feel, and this is just my personal opinion, um, or professional opinion as an economist that I think, um, I think we over theorize uh, corruption in developing economies as a function of develop of like lack of development when corruption is actually a universal feature, very much an integral part of like advanced industrialized nations. I'm not, I think like what it what the solution to corruption in say, you said in, you're from Indonesia would have to be like a very Indonesian specific um, solution. Uh, partly to do with democratic accountability in some way or the other. Um, so yeah, like I'm, I, to keep my answer short, um, I think I, I doubt like a lot of that a lot of development economists from the north would have much to say, at least that of the value about corruption in Indonesia. So sorry if that's not satisfying. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean very shortly as well. I would say again. Um, thinking about how decolonization could approach this, I would say you have to flip the discourse. So not to start from the, the point where, okay, corruption is bad. It is a characteristic of non-developed economies. You actually have to flip the discourse and think about, okay, where did this emerge in the first place when it is actually a product, a byproduct of colonialization, of colonialism, sorry, of colonialism and, and trying to understand where that comes from. From the economics point, uh, more broadly, I'm not an expert on the topic at all. I also think it's very important for us to think about the diversity of methods as well when we think about uh, decolonizing. Um, and I, I guess more broadly, it is a, a big project of pluralism because sometimes you need to go into other methods or to bring interdisciplinary insights to be able to approach this. Okay, thank uh, you. Something quickly, if you can hear me well. Yeah, it's only partially re an anecdote, partially related to your question, Binar. But um, when in the 80s, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Mahathir, faced pressure to follow an orthodox policy program, and he wanted to promote his own heterodox program, he said, if you look to the East long enough, you will see the West. And in a way, this is a very interesting way of seeing how not just in terms of the ideas pushed right by the by the by the dominant discourse but actually thinking about you know what are the ways to get there even if you have to take uh, alternative uh, routes thank you Amir, for um giving a response as well and thank you bina for being here at that time of the night um we have another person who wants to ask a question thompson should be somewhere. Okay, yeah. Thompson is not. Oh, yeah, you're here. Okay. Yes. Um, All right. Th yeah, thank you so on. much. Uh, my name is Thompson. I'm coming from Zambia. And uh, my question uh, is um, I, I think I posted. So I just wanted to just uh, maybe explain it a bit about the, the question. So uh, I was trying to uh, ask about decolonization because uh, she talked about decolonization. And uh, Along the way, uh, there are so many things that are involved. It's complex, uh, not complicated, but complex. There are so many things that are involved. Now, um, how can we address the, the same complexity of, uh, of uh, economics? And the other thing is um, when we talk of decolonization, pluralism, and diversity, are we trying to talk about the same thing or these things are different? And uh, if they're different, how will the uh, uh, 
there is the, the same uh, provisions can be different. And also the other thing is um, on the issue of decolonization, uh, maybe basically our, our universities. Uh, when you look at that, it's, it's quite uh, involving and complex, just like Dr. Daniel mentioned. So um, looking at that as students, it's quite important for us to, to, to be able to decolonize maybe our universities. So I was thinking to say, could it be okay if you as, um, as you are able to, to, to orient us or to mentor us about decolonization in economics, is it okay for you to also be able to mentor our lecturers, maybe uh, the management of each university where, where we are coming from? Because I can give an example of, as a parent, a child cannot say to say, no, mom, we're going to be eating uh, breakfast in the afternoon and uh, lunch in the morning. You need to have reasons. We are going to ask people a reason to say, why, why, are, why are we shifting from morning to afternoon and afternoon to morning? So I think uh, those are the questions that I had. Thank you. Shall go ahead. I go, shall I go yeah, first? Go okay. Very, very interesting question. Thank you, Thompson. Um, okay, in a few words. Yeah, I mentioned, yes, decolonizing is, I agree, is a complex ex exercise. Um, not necessarily, I would say complex is bad or complex is impossible. I think, I think economics, especially the, the neoclassical mainstream, if you take like a basic fundamentals of microeconomics, for instance, it is very simple, it is very basic, uh, but it, it concerns with its internal rationality. So it's not about explaining the world, but it's concerned with internal consistency, internal rationality, and it's very simple. Now, is simple useful? Not necessarily, we can say that it's crap, right? It's, it doesn't explain something or it explains a very specific context. Reality is complex, no doubt, but not necessarily I would say complex is bad or complex is untractable or unsolvable. Uh, the only thing is that because it's complex, we need to look at, into the problem through different lenses. And that's why I emphasize that the regional knowledge is so important and the diversity of methods is so important. Now, you talked about diversity versus decolonizing. So my view is that when we talk about diversity, you want to um, increase the number of a certain group or certain groups in, in the discipline. So for instance, in economics, you want to um, increase the participation of women, or you want to increase the participation on of non-white uh, scholars in the discipline. Decolonizing, it's a broader project because you want to bring diversity, but at the same time, you are questioning, challenging, and changing the knowledge. You are reclaiming the knowledge that was, let's say, previously influenced or determined by colonialism. And I, I would say it's a much harder exercise because it's not just about, let's say, bringing more women, but you're still reproducing the same knowledge. So you need to actually change that form of knowledge. And I, if I understood correctly, the last point to say this, I think one of the, the, the problems of decolonizing or to actually be able to implement this, it comes with the issue of positionality, right? So I think this is why it's important if you bring the knowledge that is, let's say locally produced, maybe this is a way to, to uh, be able to solve the, the problem but I'm just thinking out loud. Davika, please, you go. Um, I, I think we're running out of time, so I'll just say very briefly. I, you're right, like sometimes like students aren't enough. Uh, like you talked about like, how can we, how can a student demand that we do something completely different when like, you know, when you're fighting the entire structure and that's completely correct. So yeah, it's not only a job of students, it's it's all our jobs. Like it's, it's basically like, it's something that we have to do um, together basically. And I think that's important to recognize that even though economics claims to be like neutral and objective, nothing, it's not neutral and objective. It's definitely very political. And what we, what we do changes the world in a way, like our idea, we have the power to mold our own worlds. That sounds like super cliche, but it, it is indeed true. And so like part of the job is of the students, but part of the job is of the instructors. And part of the job is for like all of us to bring that knowledge to like each other, you know, talk to each other and bring that knowledge to each other. So you're right, like, I, I don't think students can do it alone. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna add that just in the interest of time. Um, we can have this conversation later also, by the way. So there are two more questions. I think maybe the first one is for you, Devika, and the second one uh, for Danielle. Okay. Um, I'm going to read the first one out. Um, 
It is from Kaustaf who um, wants to know if one way to decolonize economics is to stop the brain drain to the global north, because um, a lot of students still go to the global north, especially to the US and the UK. Um, and Kaustaf wants to know if that is a valid statement. So I think that's a great point. And the reason that's a great point is because it's a symptom of the colonized nature of the discipline rather than, rather than like, a, like a solution or a problem in itself. So you, it doesn't matter if you stop people from going or like try to reduce brain drain. The idea is that because we consider globally that the education in the United States or UK is superior, or even if we don't consider it, just that the signaling that if you go and get your education from there is a somehow superior education, that's the problem here. And in order to reclaim that actually, no, that's not the case. That in fact, the knowledge that is produced all over the world is valuable. That's like, we need to center that. You you know, and so there's several things that we can do. I can't go into all of them, but one of it is just to like talk about like, why is it that because so part of it is that you to become an economist, you have to publish in certain journals to publish in certain journals because it's like none of it is meritocratic a lot. There's so much research to show that your connection to editors of those journals, depending on like who supervised you, what university you went to is important. Therefore, for me to be considered an economist, I have to be a part of that network to do that. And that's that's part of the reason why the brain drain is happening. And so like to, in order to stop it or to like prevent it or to keep knowledge localized is in fact, it's it's a symptom of the problem. And the to, to, to decolonize economics would mean that that problem would at least reduce that the hegemony of the global north in the what is in the education of economics would be reduced. So yeah, we can there's several solutions or like potential solutions. The uh, one of them is challenging the supremacy of certain journals, for instance, or certain departments, for instance. Yeah. Thank you, Devika. Um, Nicolas, the floor is yours if you want to ask your question. I can't hear him. We, we can't hear you. Okay, it's not working. Nicholas, I'm just gonna read your question and hope that I'm not misrepresenting your question. So Nicholas, once, um, well, I have to read the question first, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So um, Nicholas wants to know something about the scientism and economics, um, which has a root in the historic physics envy of uh, economists. Um, he feels that we are reinforcing this in basic economics undergrad education, and that that is how it ends up influencing policymakers. How important is working on that uh, in order to catalyze change? And uh, how can we change this? Okay. I mean, I have, again, in one minute, what I could say about this is, yes, I agree. One of the reasons why I think neoclassical economics is still very dominant is because of the physics envy. It is because of the method. It is because of this simplicity and this internal consistency that, the consistency that is very appealing because we assume that it... it it resembles a science, right? And that therefore is very credible. It's very un um, unquestioned. It's considered to be superior. I completely agree with that. But how I think the question here is, okay, how can we actually change this and, and challenge? So thinking about, uh, for instance, thinking about the, the project of decolonizing economics, one of the ways that we can think about this is to actually think about, okay, does this actually explain something? So. I was talking to, I, I recently, a few years ago, I, I participated on a project with interviews of economists. And I remember one economist who's Brazilian, actually, he said, why do we keep insisting on the idea of equilibrium? I mean, in my work, if you live uh, in Switzerland, where everything's perfect and everything works, but when you come in, to Brazil and where you actually face that reality, nothing works in equilibrium. Equilibrium really doesn't exist. So we basically have to throw this idea away and bring something that is better suited to, to the reality that we have. So that's the way that we could start challenging it. The problem that I see, it's like um, Davika just mentioned, it's about the power structures of the discipline because we can develop our own local communities with our local knowledge and be able 
to, to make sure that that actually flourishes and it is implemented in practice. Is this going to be heard by the other economists? Most likely it won't because it's not conforming to the rules that we considered to be good economics. Thank you very much. There's one question left and I'm going to take the liberty to make that um, uh, my question and turn it into a closing statement. The question is whether it is possible uh, to decolonize economics um, and if we can achieve it. Uh, I think uh, the right question is to ask if there are enough people working on it. And uh, I think this panel has shown that there is a lot going on and that there are a lot of people that we can work with and that we can talk to and exchange ideas. There are a lot of perspectives and taking part in panels like this, taking part in the Summer Academy is a, a great way to start, I think. I want to thank everyone, especially the panelists, of course, um, for, for being here, for uh, giving your inputs and responding to all of our questions. Thank you also to everybody who participated, uh, to everyone who uh, asked questions and who was brave enough to do so in person. And yeah, sorry that we had some technical difficulties, but I think it was a great um, panel anyway. I have a few uh, remarks, housekeeping remarks again, uh, for everybody who is a participant of the Summer Academy. Your next session is the workshop tomorrow. Um, you will find the information on when that is in your classroom. And tomorrow at 17 um, in the afternoon, German time, there will be the socializing event. We're looking forward to having as many people there as possible. And also we have more evening program, uh, more evening events. The next one is on Sunday and we will talk about natural resources and accounting for them in economics. Thank you again to Devika, Amir, Danielle and Serbi. Um, and that's it for tonight. Thank you very Thank much, Tavia. It was a pleasure. It was, it was really a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having us. Bye. Thanks everyone for the questions as well. <laughs>